To any and all who may read this missive, know first that I am Tom Cavanaugh, born in 1652, formerly of Boston, now of the world, living in the year 1706, taken to isolation long ago in this place of my ancestors, in pursuit of peace and steadiness of spirit. My story is a singular one, though I make no claim to greatness or nobility. Yet there is such an amount of strangeness in my blood it bears mention, with the wish that a better understanding may come from my situation, and with the hope that, if there be any others in the world who suffer from the same perturbations of mind as I have since birth, they might find in me a kindred soul, and a friendly voice to guide them to the calmer shores of sanity. In plain words, I was born a creature of two souls, one being my own, newly minted and fresh upon the world stage, yet the other being an old and wise thing, a soul as old as the universe itself may be, two souls, therefore, in a single body, competing for supremacy. For as long as I have been a thinking being, I have felt these two tides stirring within me. How this mysterious incorporation should have occurred shall be a subject of future letters. From birth, I was known to my parents and neighbors as a boy of strange habits and impulses. My eyes, being of unequal color and dimension, always invited odd comment and query, being so easy to discern. But my behavior was also noticeably queer. I was given to gesticulations of a mysterious sort, signs and symbols that appeared to my parents to portend a meaning they could not decipher. It was also said that I never did cry or protest. Strange for a babe, but likely a comfort to my dear mother. I gained the gift of speech in my twelfth month, my first words being my love and beloved. My parents seized upon this as a good sign of robust intelligence, but could not have been much pleased with what such words implied. And right they were to be anxious, for at such a time that I should have called these kind shepherds mother and father, by the age of two years I had already taken to refer to them as Elizabeth and Thomas. A queer sort of quirk for an infant, it needn't be said. But this was my impulse, and until I passed through adolescence was a practice I stuck to. Of the city I called home for nigh two decades, I have nothing but fond memories. Boston was a place of great beauty and peace. My father was a cobbler by trade, and my mother kept a modest house as she raised me as best she could. And together we lived along the southern shores near the wharfs that saw the tall ships in their comings and goings, shuttling all manner of good to and from this young colony. I remember being always fascinated by those ships and the promise of adventure they presaged, and it was not for want of distraction or imagination that I spent many a morning sitting upon the docks to watch them enter the harbor from locations afar or disappear from it sinking into the horizon as silently as a dream. I wonder then what lay beyond that thin line of azure, and in wondering set the course of my desire. I wish to travel, to discover. So it was that I knew from those early days I would not live out my life in Boston, but would range far and wide in search of the source of the strange secrets within me. Of that more shall be writ at another time, but let it be known that I was content for a time and that I loved my parents very much. I recall with great clarity the day of my first reverie. Heretofore, I had only the sense of my bicameral mind, but on this day I was offered a glimpse as if through a window into that second buried soul, into the second life within me. I was four years of age, and it was a fresh autumn day. I was out with my parents upon an excursion strolling about the place called Beacon Hill. We, having only concluded our picnicking, now ranged about the peak to take view of the city below. It was then a coolness fell upon me. The world seemed to darken and glow all at once. I fell back, landing, it seemed, into a pair of coddling arms. A voice said to me, Go, beloved, go to your rest. As eerie as this was, as eerie as this was, a deep love suffused me. The voice went on, Your sacrifice will not be in vain, and though you must pass from this life, I will see you renewed, reborn to remain at my side forever. Never before and rarely since had I felt such a depth of adoration. Then the skies cleared and the world lighted, and I woke supine with my parents looming over me, calling my name.
It is with deep sadness I should now relate the genesis of my feeling of great isolation from my parents, even at so young an age, and my powerful sense that I was too much different from them. Meaning that, though they had borne me and raised me, I seemed not of their issue, nor of their kind. And the reverie described previously cast this feeling in a firmer mold. I seemed not to be of this world at all. Indeed, there were days when I felt not remotely human at all, but of another kind of creature entirely. Between the time of my fourth year and my fourteenth, I was given to such a profusion of reveries and ideas and dreams that I should sound mad to describe them. Yet by outward appearance I was as normal as any lad, and further, was not particularly troubled by what crossed my mind. Visions of great cities made of glass, portraits of beautiful men and women in great flowing robes, machines that generated lightning as easily as thunderclouds, vehicles that flew in the skies as birds. As I say, ideas and visions too fanciful to be entertained by any sane minds, yet all too real in my head to be ignored. When I was aged fourteen years, my father, feeling I should discover some better skill or trade sensible to my habits of mind, apprenticed me to a master carpenter joiner called Jonathan Davenport of Boston. Master Davenport had then many slaves and two other white boys in his employ, one a bricklayer by trade and the other a carpenter, both not terribly clever. But seeing in me a certain spark of intelligence and wit, Master Davenport was all too keen to place me as a joiner, and I was happy to oblige. The position earned me some two pound a year and great satisfaction of spirit. A joiner's work requires a nice and steady hand, and a great taste in ornament. Both qualities Master Davenport told me I had in large measure. And so it was with great pride that, well prior to the customary seven years, I took leave of my master after only five, and set out on my own at nineteen years of age to seek my success, now a man and master in my own right. My master was not sad to see me go, but bade me good fortune, for he knew in his heart that I was the greatest talent he had yet apprenticed. For there is something of a natural genius in you, lad, a wisdom beyond your years. And so, packing a kit of all my worldly possessions, I bid my mother and father much love and farewell, then took passage on a merchant brig bound for Jamaica in the West Indies, where need for carpenters of skill were greatly needed. It pains me now to think on my feelings of my departure from Boston, and from my dear parents who raised me so well, for in hindsight I think perhaps I should have been melancholy, or anxious at the least. Yet leaving home at so spry an age ranks as one of the great joys of my life. Never before or since did I feel such an embrace of freedom. Yet not all concerning my leaving was joyous, as it was around this time that the voices came upon me strong. Much like a man whispering in my ears, these voices were neither sinister in nature, nor did they prevent mature dealings with my fellow man. But, unlike my reveries, which came to me in my sleep or in daydreams, these voices came upon me at times inconvenient to my present purpose. Day and night they intruded without provocation, and though they were not constant, they were certainly frequent in nature. And the strangest of all had the qualities of memories. There were times, too, that I seemed to hear my own voice amongst them. Was it possible that I heard conversations from a previous life? Memories of those that I knew? Memories of engagements long past? In the next letter I shall relate what were perhaps the most confounding snatches of conversation. Here I relate one such memory, repeated ad nauseum, through the whole of my life. Myself, a man, and two women. A woman. As biological traits are passed from one generation to another, why should we not engineer the humans to pass learned information to their offspring as well? It is well within our scope. And here another woman interrupts. Never. Already we have made them sturdy and strong. Why should we gift them with new advantages over us? We are dying. The war is tilting against us. We should discover a means of our own salvation, not theirs. And here the man disagreed. Our time is done. The instruments of our will shall soon be our masters. And we shall fade away. Perhaps not in ten or twenty years, but certainly this century is our last. Why not therefore gift the humans with added faculties for wisdom and growth? Why not let them pass on accumulations of their learning from one generation to the next? 
By ever ascending degrees the humans shall be as wise as we are, and here I seem to speak. It can be done, by simple manipulation of the code within their blood. We can improve their lot, and here the second woman screams, Absolutely not! And then the memory ended. Upon my route to the West Indies, a curious incident aroused in me a revelation. It was a wanton act of violence that I witnessed, one that proved fatal only to its instigator, a pardoned pirate named Savory, who had come aboard to work off his debts as an honest Christian, yet died a devil full of drink after mistaking the reasonable abjurations of his fellow men for insults. He was taken by a self-inflicted pistol shot, sustained as he attempted to load his piece in preparation for the first of six duels which he had arranged as challenges against our group. All of us were sad for his misfortune, but none were sorry that our crew grew quieter in his absence. And yet, at seeing the poor chap wound himself so, and witnessing the blood freely flowing from his body, a notion sprung upon me like an idea long dormant, already within me, yet awaiting a chance to reappear. Thence came the phrase I had heard before, springing to my mind. The code in their blood. Suddenly it was sensible to me. The code of life, like a shipbuilder's drafts in miniature, yet responsible for building each and every man and woman on earth. How was it that such an idea made perfect sense to me? How was it I understood already that which had no precedent in the most modern philosophies? The code of life, in our blood, imagine! These ideas swirled within me for many weeks upon that voyage. Spinning in such a maelstrom of thought, I could not articulate them. Reaching Jamaica, I pushed all idle thoughts and fantasies from my mind and set about finding my self-employment. A letter of endorsement from my mentor, Mr. Davenport, hastened my success, and within a fortnight I was able to secure an interview with an agent working for the esteemable Mr. Peter Beckford, a man known wide across the West Indies as a one of honor, and good intelligence, as I must say was his agent, for the man hired me on the spot, and within a two days time was I set to work upon the slaves' quarters, fitting them with sturdier doors and tighter roofs. For my own accommodations, I am well pleased to tell that they were fine. Three windows had I, two of which looked upon the cane fields. When opened, a light breeze filled my room, one scented with the raw perfume of the nearby sea, and the distant of a hushing ocean surf. Often, too, the spiritual songs of the Negroes hard at work entered and gave me a deep calm. It was pleasant there. Only this comfort could not mask the dread I felt at the thought of catching the yellow fever or another of the innumerable ailments that often struck those newly arrived to these parts. For my part, I saw well over seventeen men and women perish from the disease within six months of my arrival. It seemed then that the every success I had, another two or three potential hazards lie in wait. And as time would tell, this proved most unfortunately true. Of my employer, I must say something, for it was owing to his connections that I came to find such troubled dealings. Peter Beckford was a man of great charisma and pride. In 1662, he had come to Jamaica, and in just ten years, had fast procured himself a sizable portion of land, which he sowed with cane as early as he was able. Upon my coming into his orbit, he owned claimed all about him, rivaling only kings and emperors for his largesse. This same surplus applied to the number of slaves in his employ. Whereas he had arrived in Jamaica with a complement of three, he now owned the better part of three hundred. A shrewd and relentless man of business, Mr. Beckford was known also to be subservient to a temper of cyclonic power. Wrath and fury and enmity were his primary means of settling arguments that could not be concluded in Mr. Beckford's immediate favor. He was, however, always kind to me and as gracious a man as one could hope an employer to be. But this I put down to my status in his eyes. He was a traditional man with a respect for rank and breeding. In earlier times he had been the governor de facto of the island, and though a statesman no longer upon my arrival, he still bore all the signs of a man who felt it his natural duty to lead. Further, his political connections he valued as deeply as his sugar and the money it brought him. And it was in this capacity, following the arrival of a Spanish soldier, that I met the man who would change my life for the worse forever, a young man named Loreno Torres. It was in April of 1673 when I spied the galleon in Kingston's harbor, flying the colors of the men of Holland, which I thought queer but not unlikely. This was a ruse, however, for the ship's cargo was most assuredly Spanish. 
A gentleman called Torres, once a soldier in the Spanish army, now an emissary on behalf of his king. Or so said he to Peter Beckford. I learned later that he called himself a Templar, and had made his visit to Beckford's plantation to look upon Master Beckford's strange collection of collected manuscripts. Torres was two days with Mr. Beckford when another object took his full attention, namely me. The sight of my face stirred in him a strange sort of excitement, which I found altogether untoward at first, until he plied me with questions that shocked me to the core of my being. Said he to me one evening after supper, Hear you voices, Mr. Cavanaugh. How is that? I answered, feigning ignorance, though shaken in truth. Voices from the dark of your mind, or memories, to be clearer, as if from another life entirely. And here I was terrified. How was it that this man knew the odd riddle of my life as if it were a banal fact of history? I know not what you mean, Master Torres, and I took my leave of him, so anxious as I was. Good night to you, sir, he said, as I departed. We shall speak again when you are rested and ready to talk. Still shaken, I bade him good night and made for my bedchamber, feeling another reverie coming strong upon me. When I reached my bed, I fell into both. Here I relate another reverie. Myself and a woman. Beloved, she said, a voice so intimate and familiar. Our colleagues conspire against us. They dither and sigh, resign to their fates, content to champion the humans. But there is hope for us. There is a chance we might inure our bodies to the chilling world, the poisoned atmosphere, and the war itself. Will you aid me? Will you submit? And here I hear my own voice in answer. Yes, beloved. What must I do? Transference, she said. The shuttling of our minds from these old bodies into new forms, mechanical bodies perhaps, or into those of our instruments, our humans. In short, I believe there may be a way to transfer all we know and all we are into other forms. In this way we may survive the coming cataclysm and live to see our people repopulate the earth and recover her from those we foolishly set loose upon it. Transference, I said aloud, our minds into alternate vessels, a dangerous prospect. But reasonable. Yes, she said. And who better to make this leap than you, my beloved husband? With a mind unparalleled, a constitution unrivaled, architect of the observatory, overseer of Eden's tools, and the brightest light in our civilization. If you are not capable of making this leap, perhaps no one is. And here replied I, I will do this for you, beloved, for us and our people. Lost as I was in my reverie, I failed to see the envelope slipped near the door to my bedchamber. It read thus, Dear Sir, forgive the alarm I must have raised with my queries, but you have the exact likeness of a man my colleagues and I have longed to meet. Allow me an audience and I will explain all. Your friend, Loreno Torres. I pondered this letter for some time that evening, wondering what it could mean that I had the exact likeness of a man he knew, and why it should raise so much intrigue. I wondered this for hours, pacing about the room with a mind to slip from the chamber, when of a sudden I heard a rapid succession of reports from pistols and rifles outside in the garden. To my ears it sounded as if a war had begun, with me a bystander at its center. I dropped to my knees and hid on the far side of my bed, away from the window, and shut my eyes. But as I did this, a man called out to me from my chamber door. Mr. Cavanaugh! it said. I raised my head and opened my eyes and there saw a figure cutting a terrible outline, hooded and robed in dusky sienna. A man lifted a small pipe to his lips and blew. I felt a sting upon my neck, as if from a mosquito. I opened my mouth to protest, but thereupon a wave of fatigue took me, and I fell fast asleep. I woke some days hence in a bustling native village in the presence of the same man, many leagues from where I had called my home. A native himself with a strong and serious but gentle face. He named himself Balam, and bade me not be frightened. Strangely, I was not, for his demeanor was calm and his words were kind. I asked him why he had brought me to this place. His surprise seemed genuine, and he told me, You are a sage. Your face tells it plain, your eyes most of all. I did not know what to make of this suggestion. He went on. You are but one of a long lineage of identical men, men born outside their original time. Your likeness and your soul are a pattern, repeated through the ages. Oftentimes a century or more passes without the appearance of a sage. Other times, two are born in the same decade. We know not why. 
and dash my brains, but all he spoke was known to me in some intrinsic way, and yet it frightened me all the same. How could it be that I was a man reborn? How could it be that I had already lived one life, and had plodded through a second, still pondering the first? I spent many a day with this man Balaam, and in that time he told me all he knew, then asked questions of his own he hoped I might answer. For several days I stayed with my captor Balaam, asking all manner of questions, and he asking the same of me, and all the while I wondered what fate he intended for me. At last, on the seventh day, I revealed what lay heavy on my heart. What do you want of me, sir, that you keep me prisoner so? And at this, Balaam laughed and answered, You are no prisoner, sage. You may take your leave at any point. Only tell us where you wish to be dropped, and if it be in our power, we shall transport you thence. This answer surprised, then angered me, why then did you spear me away in such a diabolical method, kidnapped no less? And said he in answer, Your master hosted a Templar, and may now be one himself. Such men are not to be trusted with a prize so valuable as you. Steer clear of them, for they seek the knowledge that hides in your mind, your dreams, your memories, and the location of a place once dear to you, the observatory. This word rang in my ears, for I had heard it before, another memory from a time long ago. And what do you desire of me, sir? I asked him. Would you steal the secrets buried within me, too? Alam smiled. I would not shun them, but to share them is a point for you to decide. Your secrets are your own, and yours alone to lend. After my difficult counsel with Balaam, I took a day to ruminate on what should be done. Notions strange and uncertain battled in my head for supremacy, and I was never one idea long before its opposite seemed a better option. Yet at last I made my decision. Sir, you have been gracious with me, I told him, and my trust in you is complete. Yet I cannot share my visions and memories without first understanding them myself. I must therefore take my leave and travel in secret to a place that has occupied my thoughts for many years. Balaam smiled and said, I understand well, and I believe in your cause. To find the source of your reveries will do you a great good. Go, therefore, and answer these riddles. We will provide you with supplies to see you safely embarked. To which I replied, Thank you, sir. And if what I find satisfies me, I will return hither and provide you with answers that may satisfy you as well. In the days following, Balaam was true to his word. With his young son, Atabai, in tow, he transported me first unto a fishing village near his own compound and supplied me with map and coin before issuing a warning. The Templars are lately come to the West Indies, and this Torres is their Grand Master, and though few now in number, there must soon be others. Take heed of them, and trust not their entreaties, for what they cannot earn by conversation they will take by force. And with this and a hearty goodbye, I took my leave of this assassin, and set out for parts unknown, a vague sense of purpose pulling me forward. After leaving Balaam, I set out in a sloop of my own and traveled for nigh on one year about the West Indies, sailing with a small crew to all manner of jungles and playas and beaches, looking for a sign or a landform that might spark in me a memory. Along the way I met many of fine peoples who did me a great kindness and offered work in exchange for more provisions. In this way I came to know the people of the New World and of the Old, and found in all of them the same hopes and desires. To travel is truly the finest education. Then, after my thirteenth month of roving, I found my object well inlaid on a known island. Here it was, the place Bedlam had called the Observatory. Oh, what memories the location aroused, well prior to clapping eyes upon its structure. I knew I had come to the correct spot. Leaving my men on shore, I passed alone through jungles and deep ravines, coming at last upon the spot, and there marveled at the strange and foreboding presence. Without prompt, I knew what to do. I pressed my finger into what I knew to be a portal, and upon its opening I passed inside. What I saw there, however, shall remain a mystery, for the world is not ready to hear my tales, which sound like sorcery to all but my friend Balaam, and perhaps the Templars who likely still chase me. I remained alone at the observatory's location, plumbing its secrets, all the while besieged by such an influx of reveries it would require a tome twice the size of the Bible to relate all of them. Let it suffice to say that I came to understand the nature of the two souls within me, and I am now content. After near on a week there, I was visited by a group of natives from the island, people of the Tiano tribe, I believe. 
They spotted me first and might have killed me straight away had my utter surprise not widened my eyes to such a degree that their unusual qualities were seen by all. At seeing me thus, the natives stopped and dropped to their knees with slow gesticulations. I understood at once that these men were sworn to protect this place, and in my further conversations with them, I had made out that it was a previous sage who had employed them so, or more precisely, I should say, employed their ancestors thus, for nearly a hundred fifty years had passed since the last sage had come this way. I am told his grave lies nearby, but is unmarked and inaccessible. It has now been over four decades since my arrival at this sacred place, and only one question yet lingers in my mind. How many more of my sort have been here in total? Near eighty millennia have passed since our inception, and I am apt to believe the number is quite high, but I cannot know for certain. But let that not trouble you, reader. For if you have followed my story entire, look you for my final missive in the place where I will soon surely lay, hidden near the observatory where I have instructed the guardians of this place to bury me, when my passage across this mortal coil is at its end. Therefore, fare thee well until then. As I write, the year is now near upon 1706, and I am sickly and in poor condition, and so must tell what little else I can of my condition. All I tell here I have dredged from the dark void of my memory. I cannot confirm or prove what I argue, but perhaps, if some others like me were to see this, they too would understand and feel not as alone as I so often have. In my original life I died in the midst of my beloved's experiment. This method of which she spoke, of the transference of my mind into machine, and from thence into a human body, was a failure. Yet an instructive one, I believe. For in my last moments I recollect her comforts to me, and a clear promise that my death would not be an end, but a beginning. There is another way, beloved, she said to me. Imperfect, yet possible. Firstly, I will agree to carry out Minerva's experiments, her terrible gift to the humans. Yet my purpose will be contrary. My purpose will be your immortality. In collecting samples of the code in the human's blood, I will add my own augmentations, samples of your code, transfigured in such a way that when the proper pieces come together, it may further transfigure the zygote of a newly conceived child. In this way, you shall be reborn again and again throughout the ages. With luck, this recessive recurrence shall never die out, but travel on like a raft downstream along the tide of inheritance. I was dying as she spoke, there in my beloved's arms, but I understood her meaning well. Look for me, beloved. Your death shall not be in vain, for I will be with you again, entombed, lying in wait, ready to emerge again when the time is right. She then pierced me through the heart, thus ending my life. How truly bizarre it is that I can claim to have a memory of my own death is a ludicrous idea, and yet I know that it happened, and that I now live again, many centuries from that time, waiting for the final piece of this riddle to reveal itself. Yet how this will be, I cannot say. Thus, to any and all who have read this and understood little, be not upset, for there is more mystery than sense in the world, and our only purpose is to endure it. TK1706 and so ends the tale of the sage previous. A charge attack. A charge attack allows you to temporarily speed up the jackdaw to ram an enemy ship with more strength. Hold left trigger while looking forward and double tap A to charge. Oh goodness, that's silly. I have to do it. So we finally killed all four legendary ships. The last two, pretty annoying. The impetuous or whatever it was, the top left one, it uh, basically just ran you down and moved as if physics didn't exist. So it was kind of frustrating. Um, and the one down here that I just beat was a heavily armored, could not be damaged, not really, from its sides. Uh, oh, rogue wave. Um, it could not be um, damaged from the sides, so you had to get behind it. But it constantly fired off mortars, and for some reason, it didn't have the uh, the warning lines that mortars were coming. Which, I love it when the game just ignores its own darn mechanics. You know, that's, gosh, that's just the best. Um, but, uh, you know, I eventually just stayed behind it, and I, I, I did a good job of, you know, turning down my speed so that I wouldn't... Um, 
turning down my speed and changing direction really quickly to avoid the mortars because as strong as it was, they were all fixed. Holy crap. That was a lot of damage. <laughs> How silly is this now that I'm on the other side of all of this and and now I can <laughs> now I can just charge murder boats. Let's see how much damage it actually does. Are you serious? Wow. I really am the best, huh? Okay. Well, we did it. We beat the four legendary ships. The seas belong to me's, and I have brought them to their knees. Nice job. Guys, I think that's going to be the end of this. I think that's the last thing that we're going to do in the game. Um, obviously, I'm I'm at, I'm at about I think it said I'm at whoops I'm at 97% synchronization. Yeah, 97% synchronization. I don't know where to get the maps for the final buried chests. Otherwise, I would do those. And obviously, there's the handful of side missions that I just didn't do. I don't know if you get anything for doing 100% synchronization. I probably won't. But uh. It's been a good time. It's been a real good time. Um, thank you guys for joining me on this journey. Uh, I don't know what game is next as of recording this, so I can't really tease that. But yeah, this was. I'm really glad that I played this. Because um, I'll be completely honest, I completely wrote off the um, the Assassin's Creed uh, game line. And yeah, I'm not really like, ooh, I'm gonna play the next ones. But it's it's good to know that that there's more than just the first couple that were good. Um, all right, I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.